So it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, who is Professor Kath Noakes. Uh, Kath is a professor of environmental engineering uh, for buildings in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. And she's actually the deputy director of the Leeds Institute for Fluid Dynamics. Um, and uh, she's an engineer who has been working for a number of years now in uh, issues to do with ventilation and indoor air quality. And a lot of a focus of her work is on the impacts of this on health um, and in particular controlling uh, disease, disease transmission uh, in, uh, in buildings. Um, you will probably have been quite aware of Catherine in recent weeks because she's been in the media a lot. Uh, and I think if you missed the chance to hear her talk uh, uh, in the Life Scientific on Radio 4 a few Tuesdays ago, uh, then I strongly recommend that you uh, take the time to listen to that on BBC Sounds uh, and you'll get to know the person as well as uh, some of the science. Uh, Kath is very heavily involved with uh, COVID work. Um, she's on SAGE. Um, and has recently been recognised for her public service by uh, the award of an OBE. So we're very pleased to have her uh, working here as because uh, uh, she's about the busiest person I know. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm very pleased that she's taken the time out to give us a talk on infection transmission in the built environment, the interface of biology, fluid dynamics design and human behaviour. So over to you, Kath. Thank you very much, Paul. And yeah, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, yeah, so I would like to spend uh, this afternoon giving you just a, a bit of an overview really of, of, I suppose, the role of fluid dynamics in infection transmission. It's, it's an area where there's an awful lot of fluid dynamics and actually very little work. So maybe it will spark some thoughts and ideas amongst many of you too. Um, I'll start by infectious disease and, on the left, we've got the top 10 global causes of death. This is uh, slightly out of date now. WHO data uh, gets updated every few years. Um, if you start to look at that, you realise that a very significant number of those diseases on there are related to um, respiratory infections. So transmission of disease through the air. And many of those which are not, even the, the top two on there, are related to air quality. So actually exposure and respiratory exposure plays an enormous role in global disease. And again, the data on the right hand side, which I know is also a couple of weeks out of date now, I think we're at 2.3 million deaths now, is coronavirus, which has, has been um, a something else for us all um, to, to be challenged with. I, I wanted to put these numbers up there because you can see that the impact of coronavirus, the single impact of that one disease, is going to make it land in the top 10 global causes of death. Um, it is probably going to overtake tuberculosis, um, may well overtake many of the others. So I think that's, you know, it's quite sobering how significant that one infection has been this year. Um, it is a respiratory disease. When did we start learning about respiratory diseases? Well, you go back to the late 1800s and uh, work of people like Fluger um, noticed that respiratory droplets contain bacteria. Um, and I love this quote, which is from the, uh, a, a, a study on the House of Commons ventilation in 1905 where they um, actually looked at uh, the measuring bacteria in the air from the debating chamber and they noticed that there was more in the air associated with, with when debating happened and acknowledged that uh, this was probably quite a significant thing to be worrying about. Um, uh, and therefore the House of Commons ventilation might matter. Uh, it's quite amazing how these things come back around. Um, a lot of what we're talking about with respiratory diseases, though, we learnt in from about the 1930s onwards that airborne transmission played a part in this. So early days, it was very much seen to be uh, large droplets land on surfaces. The role of ventilation was not so important. And even if you go back historically with tuberculosis, it historically was associated with droplets. You find posters from the 1800s talking about don't spit. 
Um, but uh, William Firth Wells from Harvard in the 1930s, he's the guy in the black and white photo, he proposed the idea of a droplet nuclei. And this is essentially when somebody exhales um, a respiratory droplets that will evaporate. It will leave essentially just a core of the, the, the microorganism and a, a few other salts and surfactants and things like that. Um, and it would therefore stay airborne for a long period of time. And he worked with Richard Riley, who's the other guy in the check shirt. Um, they conducted a seminal study in, on tuberculosis, uh, late 1950s, early 60s. And basically they um, took the air from patient wards where they were, had uh, tuberculosis, they passed it through ducks, they passed it through cages of guinea pigs on the roof, which is the diagram on the right. And they infected uh, 134 guinea pigs over a four year period. And they basically showed that TB must be airborne because the only way those guinea pigs were exposed to TB was via the air. So the, the tiny mycobacteria and tuberculosis bacteria were being carried through that ventilation air um, and to infect those guinea pigs. They also actually at the same time pulled ultraviolet disinfection units in and showed that they were an infective control. It's really interesting that that was done so long ago. And then, of course, uh, antibiotics took over. We uh, energy efficiency buildings took over. We forgot that this mattered. Um, it comes came, comes back sporadically every time there's a bit of an outbreak. But, um, you know, it's only really now we're, we're, we're really paying attention to it again. It's also worth noting that we've got some conclusive evidence that TB is transmitted by the air. We lack it for many other diseases, including influenza and including COVID-19. It's very hard to conclusively prove, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But before I do, I just actually want to mention there's other diseases too. So respiratory diseases is the most obvious one you think of associated with droplets, aerosols, fluid dynamics. But actually, gastrointestinal diseases, things like norovirus and Clostridium difficile, they too can be transmitted through droplets and aerosols diarrhea and vomit, both will produce very large droplets, sprays, as well as aerosols. And then there's a whole raft of environmental pathogens that could be released by water waste systems in buildings, so drainage systems. Um, some of these will have uh, maybe, maybe carried in water, some of these may be carried in some form of solids um, from faecal matter. Uh, some of these may be actually carried in air, so fungal spores carried long distances outdoors. Um, and of course, within the water systems, we also have biofilms which can break off and potentially be part of these aerosols. And the, all of these um, pathogens, some of these may be communicable diseases, but on the whole, a lot of them are actually what we call opportunistic pathogens. So don't spread person to person, but will spread from the environment to a person. And many of these, for example, Pseudomonas um, is a big challenge in hospitals. There are various um, drug resistant uh, bacteria. There are problems in hospitals and are associated with drainage systems. And um, NTM stands for non-tuberculosis mycobacteria, which are associated with respiratory disease um, and are often associated with showers. So there are some processes in here. And what's quite interesting is a real lack of understanding of the trans the mechanism from where does that microorganism how does it get carried from its source through the environment to a person and how does it infect them is it through the air is it through contact routes through droplets um, very very challenging to understand um, if we think about buildings whether we're talking about respiratory or whether we're talking about uh, these water systems and things I think we can probably characterize the flows. So we've got flows which are driven by water. So maybe jet breakup or splash. And we've got flows which are then air driven, which may be those associated with ventilation. So respiratory diseases linked to ventilation systems, um, possibly also drainage sacs. And there are also those which, again, respiratory diseases, there's concern around with COVID, what we call aerosol generating procedures. So I think these are, it, it, it's a, in a way of thinking about the different mechanisms that might actually result in microorganisms being released into the environment in some way and then dispersed within those environments. But all of these actually when they start to go into a real environment are incredibly complicated. So the basic physics and fluid dynamics of that we're interested in 
how, what sizes of droplets are formed, how many are formed, but how are they formed but actually within, for example, respiratory? How do these actually get formed within the um, respiratory system? Is it different in different places uh, as people talk, as people breathe? Um, and then how do they get released? How does that change with things like vocalization? If we think about environment, environmental systems, do they get released in different ways from different types of systems? And then once they're in the environment, what are the determinants for how they get transported? But we, the physics tells us an awful lot, but then we can't do that alone. The microbiology is hugely important here because the different pathogens there will be different sizes. They will replicate and survive in different ways. Um, and understanding whether it's an environmental or human source is a very significant aspect to this you know because therefore you know where where are we trying to understand where it's coming from and I think we don't understand a great deal about how these different sizes of droplets in different um, cases actually get hold of microorganisms and carry them and even whether the microorganisms themselves affect the properties of the droplets there's a lot of um, a lot of missing information here and then when we start to go into the real world environment, we've got some complexity in here too. the actual environment itself. How is it designed? How is it maintained? What's the layout in there? What's the ventilation system? What's the air distribution? Um, and understanding though that, you know, we, the idealized, take, going from an idealized fluid dynamics model into a real world complex environment is challenging. Then of course we put the people on there and the people make it even more challenging as in where do they get exposed how do they get exposed um what are they what how important are things like the thermal plume above somebody's head or the movement of somebody in the environment and then you know the if somebody's doing particular activities what does that do in terms of emission and dispersion and it's very easy in a model to think about assuming you know something that's relatively steady state and we actually know that people you know we know for example with tuberculosis that people don't just breathe out tuberculosis continuously it's sporadic sometimes they do sometimes they don't sometimes they'll breathe it out at night sometimes they'll breathe it out during the day so it isn't as simple as just a, a nice emission source let's go back to uh, our favorite pathogen of the day which is SARS-CoV-2 um, and if we start to map how this could transmit it becomes complex. Um, we know that being the, the respiratory activity will create a whole range of different droplet sizes, um, which will behave in different ways and cause different type, different routes of transmission. Um, for simplicity, we've grouped this into three. So airborne via, via aerosols. Um, close range transmission is actually quite challenging because we know it is a combination of droplets and aerosols together. Um, and what you know it's actually quite hard epidemiologically to separate that out and then it's very tempting to um not think very much about surfaces but actually that is a very complex route in its own right with um surfaces being contaminated both through deposition and through the fact that people may well just have you know coughed on their hand wiped their nose they've got it on their hands and contaminate surfaces um, and even those processes of picking up, touching down, so touching down microorganisms, um, there is a fluid structure interaction problem there, which is quite easy, very, very difficult to, to work through and very, very stochastic too. So you can see, I mean, it's not surprising, it's difficult to work this out. And, and if we start looking at the evidence base for how do we know transmission, how transmission happens, it's actually very difficult. So we know that from animal studies that both air routes and surface routes are possible. We don't quite have exactly the mechanisms or the relative proportions of those. Uh, we know from many of the outbreak and epidemiological studies that transmission is associated with indoor environments and being close together. But again, exactly how that happens is quite challenging. We know that there's quite a limited evidence base for transmission via surfaces. It certainly feels that the, uh, the, the likelihood of getting something off your, um, your Amazon delivery packages or your shopping are likely to be pretty low risk. But surfaces close to very um, uh, people who are infected in the household are very contaminated. We know that. Um, it's a very over dispersed disease and super spreading happens. We don't know how frequently it happens, 
but we do know that it's probably airborne when it does. Um, with regard to airborne, we know that that's been associated with poorly ventilated spaces. There's very little evidence of it happening well ventilated spaces. Uh, but again, we don't, it's, it's, it's easy to see evidence when you've got a big outbreak. It's very difficult to get evidence of absence of transmission. Um, and there's some, some odd little pockets of evidence that suggest air conditioning units with higher velocity flows maintain droplets in the air for longer. Um, I think one of the important things to recognise is transmission can happen anywhere and it's actually very hard to unpick it. The, the, the population level data, which is what we have a lot of, doesn't really tell us much about the, the nuances of transmission. We do know quite a lot about different risk factors. And the other interesting thing is that it isn't always what it seems. So it's very easy to see a media report that says outbreak associated with you know, DVLA, for example. Um, but actually, we don't know whether that happened in the workplace or whether it happened in a shared car or in a social setting or in houses which people shared together. And what you actually find is that an awful lot of the transmission happens at the interfaces between spaces rather than nice and neatly within a particular environment. So a very, very complex picture. Um, I have mentioned already a bit about aerosols and droplets, and I think it's just worth highlighting that this is a a bit of a conundrum area. So in the medical field, infection control says a five micron uh, particle is airborne and above five micron is a droplet. And I, I don't need to tell anybody in this uh, um, webinar that that is untrue. Um, and we know from exposure science that up to 100 microns inhalable. What it really probably does mean is that um, this depends on the disease. So for something like tuberculosis, it is only the five micron type particles that matter because I, um, infection happens when those particles reach the alveoli of the lungs and, uh, and cause infection. If they deposit out in the nose, it doesn't really matter. But for SARS-CoV-2, it does because those bigger part that we have the, the receptors for the, the virus all the way through our respiratory system. And so actually the bigger particles that may carry more virus are as important as the smaller ones. And just to look at respiratory aerosols, the virus itself is tiny, it's around 100 nanometers, but it's not a naked virus that's contained within respiratory fluids. Uh, there are various studies over the years that have looked at uh, measuring uh, respiratory aerosols and droplets. Um, and probably the nicest paper on this is Johnson's paper from uh, 2011, which put all of the data together and proposed a model for look uh, on uh, for three different modes. And they actually suggest that there are different modes that happen under different respiratory activities. So they suggest a, a bronchial fluid film burst approach, um, mechanism when people breathe. They suggest that the larynx provide, plays a big part when you are um, perhaps voice, speaking loudly and coughing, uh, singing and coughing, and that the oral route, so my, uh, droplets from the mouth, matter more with speech and coughing. And the different size particles will come from different places in the respiratory system, and um, that might well affect how much virus they carry, because it depends on how much virus is in the respiratory fluids at that point in the respiratory system. Um, these were very much the, 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 day, the, the droplet sizes um, when people exhale initially, um, but then of course what happens is they will evaporate and typically down to about 20 to 50 percent of the original diameter, and that happens very, very rapidly in the environment. But those are not the pathogens, those are just the aerosols, so what about the pathogens? We don't have any data for SARS-CoV-2 yet. Um, this is data for influenza measured using a, a, a condensation particle counter type methodology, the guy with his head in a cone. Um, and I think I want to just draw two things in here is one, this is split between coarse and fine, five, above and below five microns. Um, they're measuring RNA copies, um, so this isn't the live virus. Um, you see similar-ish numbers in the course and the fine fraction, possibly slightly more in the fine fraction. But there's an enormous range. There's almost a, a four orders of magnitude difference across those people. So different people will produce different amounts. 
and that can mean a huge difference in any risk. Um, so maybe it is only the ones who are producing at the top end that are actually capable of, of, of aerosol transmission. Maybe the ones down the bottom end don't matter so much. We don't know that yet. Um, we know that also there's a lot of variability with activity. Um, and again, what I wanted to draw your attention to here is that if people sing or speak more loudly, we see an increase in the number of particles that are generated. Um, but I will just look at the breathing data and look at the gain, the distribution. So even just within a group of people, I think there were 25 people in this study, the, the difference between people's outputs just when they're breathing passively is huge. Um, so it's actually, be, you, know, you can start to see how messy this problem is going to be. Uh, and on top of that, the viral load variation. So this is data from um, actually fairly early in the pandemic from sym symptomatic people, but actually just shows that, um, well, you can see there's quite a lot of variation in there, but that the, the viral load tends to peak um, at the very beginning of the disease and drop off during the disease. So um, pretty challenging, you know, there's a lot of variation caused by this too. Okay, so we've now got virus in, in the breath. Um, I won't go into this in much detail because I know that there have been previous um, talks that have considered some of this, but uh, um, the actual exhalation is, is complex. Um, we do know that it doesn't just necessarily uh, come out in a nice neat cone and disperse beautifully, that there are these um, turbulent puffs where the, the droplets and aerosols can hang together in clouds and travel over bigger distances than you think they should. Um, and I think, I just, I mean, this is an incredibly simple um, diagram just showing um, Stokes settling. Um, but I, the reason I wanted to show you this is that Stokes settling assumes still air, yet, you know, the falling velocities of these are comparable to room air velocities. Room air velocities are typically 0 0.05, possibly up to 0.1, and possibly even higher in some circumstances, meters per second. So we are, we're, we've got things that are settling at a similar order of magnet rate to the room air velocities, which means they will not settle as quickly as um, the basic models will suggest. I wanted to just touch on um, some of the non-respiratory ones. So just before we go on to some of how to mitigate this, um, I think thinking through what do we know about some of the other routes and, and this I've been thinking about this with a PhD student about aerosol generating from showers and thinking about how um, different types of showers might actually generate uh, aerosols in different ways um, and it would the, the likely relationship between uh, velocities um, and nozzle sizes and the likelihood of, of um, aerosol generation. Um, and this is some quite nice data from a, a study carried out at the uh, University of Texas in Austin, where they looked at uh, visualizing um, the, the shower, uh, breakup of droplets in a shower, also measured aerosols and they measured biological aerosols too. Um, and they, they carry this out with a, a two different shower heads, one with a, a conventional shower head and the other with a, a low flow one designed to be used in water stressed areas. Um, and I think what's quite interesting from the imaging is, is showing just how much um, droplet breakup happens in here and how this is potentially a mechanism for that aerosolization. And then when you actually look at the aerosolization, you can see that these do produce quite significant numbers of particles in the respirable range um, and that low flow shower heads do tend to produce slightly smaller particles, um, presumably because they're using a, a some form of aeration to, um, uh, to compensate for the lower, lower flow rate in terms of the comfort that people feel in the shower. Um, but we also have to think about aerosolization from splashing. There's some very uh, lovely videos out there on the, and I'm not complaining any credit whatsoever. These are just what I've uh, found in my uh, searches on the web. But um, 
uh, understanding these processes there's some lovely work on on um, measurement uh, well visualization of these you can very clearly see the mechanism for the aerosolization what we don't know is if there is a microorganism in that liquid what happens to it is it contained within those droplets and if so how is it carried um, but I did this one is again another another mechanism for thinking about showers and thinking about splashes and water systems in buildings and this is the again quite a nice visualization showing the aerosols form through uh, a, a droplet and the bubbles bursting from, uh, from that droplet um, and again we're generating respirable sized aerosols here um, and this is something that you experience you, you pour yourself a, a glass of champagne or fizzy water or something hold it to your face and you can experience that one but what I thought was really interesting with this study is that they did start to say well what happens if there are bacteria in here um, and they didn't use bacteria they used a, a, a surrogate so they used some fluorescent spheres um, but they did two cases one where the drop itself carries the bacteria and the second where the bacteria is on the soil so they were actually thinking about raindrops here um, but if you look at the, the the graph what you see is that actually both will release particles into the air whether it's in the drop or whether it's on the surface and the amount of particles are actually governed by the um the the, the um, concentration of that um, surrogate bacteria within it rather than whether it's in the droplet or on the surface. So again quite you know it starts to give some clues as to the mechanisms and starts to think about how we might be able to aerosolize things from um, many of these mechanisms in, in buildings you know so this is not just about respiratory pathogens. Okay, I'm now going to move on and talk about how we might control this. Um, as an engineer, this is where I've spent a lot of my time thinking about how we can, particularly around airborne risks and how we can use ventilation strategies to control through dilution, through the particular distribution of air, um, but also thinking about how we can use in inactivation technologies, particularly air cleaning type technologies. Um, so, Again, here's my uh, my map of the uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus transmission or COVID-19, um, and I just wanted to show very quickly that how the interventions that we use, and there are a lot of them out there, have to be thought of in the context of the transmission mechanism, and have to be thought of in the context of whether we are mitigating the source or whether we are mitigating the exposure. Um, and where in the system they're applied. And I, you know, when you think about it from a physics perspective, it's very obvious, or perhaps it is to me, but um, I think a lot of this is not necessarily articulated particularly well uh, as people are thinking through this. So how can we go and assess that exposure? What can we do? Well, again, here's a, you know, another, another complex picture which shows the, the various mechanisms that are all going to happen once we're now in a room, so we're now thinking about how to control the environment. Um, at the very simplest level, we can use some mass balance models, um, just estimate concentrations in air. Um, it is a, a very large approximation, but we can assume fully mixed flows, um, which when we're, we're not, not clear, close to enough, when we're some distance from the source, can, um, can be effective. And they can give us some estimates. So they can give us some bar ballpark estimates of, of the relative contributions of different factors. Um, I think, you know, again, it's a very simple um, graph, but to just illustrate the, the difference that some of these things make. So um, on the left, you've got a, a, a simple mixed model for what the virus look like in an office. First of all, it's not necessarily steady state because we're going to have it increasing with time and everything in here is relative to uh, the office scenario at 10 litres per second per person. If we halve the ventilation rate, we will obviously um, double the, the steady state concentration. We take it down to one litre per second per person. You can see that even after seven hours, you wouldn't necessarily reach a steady state. And so many spaces will be operating under transient conditions 
both with the, the airflow itself and the virus in the air. Take those same ventilation rates and put it into a very large space. And I picked a sports hall on purpose because they're often used as vaccination centers. You start to see that the amount that, that you would be exposed to is tiny. Um, again, this is obvious. It's just simple um, dilution relationships, but it's just to illustrate that actually demand, you may have seen people say, well, we should have six air changes an hour, or we should have two air changes an hour or whatever actually it's not as simple as that because it really does depend on the size of the space and the um, what's happening in that environment so we need to be far more nuanced about it and think through uh, the actually the, the, the volume flow rate to be quite honest for these spaces but we can take some of these models and we can look at relative risks so we put together a, a, a markov chain type model with this to look at a uh, uh, estimates, stochastic estimates for uh, a number of different scenarios. These scenarios differ um, both on the, the vocalization, so the amount of virus emitted, the duration that people are exposed in those spaces, the size of the spaces and the assumptions around ventilation. And everything is referenced to a classroom scenario, which would have, um, if, if have the equivalent ventilation to allow 1500 parts per million CO2. So we looked at three different classroom scenarios, we've looked at some offices, we can see that th we've got coffee shops, supermarkets, etc. in here. And some of these come out very low, um, only from an airborne risk perspective, remember, so we haven't done any other risks, but they come out low because people don't spend very much time there. Um, in all of these scenarios, people are there all day, every day, Whereas here, they're, they're exposed for short, much shorter periods of time. You'll notice we've got one in here called Skagit Choir. This is a very famous outbreak um, in Washington, um, which infected 87% of the people in the room in a two and a half hour period when everybody was singing in a poorly ventilated room. And you can see even without, you know, the, the real details of this one, that the risk factors just shoot up on this one because we've inherently put a whole raft of risk factors together. Um, but this model is, gives you uh, some really kind of in, initial insights into the relative risks around airborne transmission uh, or airborne exposure, I should say, rather than transmission. But we can't link that directly to risk of infection. We have to think about doing this in a, a, a different way. Um, one of the most common ways that's used to do this is using something called the Wells-Riley equation, which essentially treats um, looks at how many people are susceptible, how many people are infectious, it includes the room ventilation rate, the breathing rate, and then it has this parameter called quanta, which is a, a, a little bit of a cheap parameter, but it's the number of infectious doses generated per unit time. So it encompasses in there the concentration of the virus in the air. Um, if it's in multiple different particle sizes, it's all wrapped in together in this one, but it also encompasses the dose response, so how, uh, susceptible, how, how it affects people who are susceptible to the virus. Um, and these quanta values are often back calculated from different diseases, and even just looking at these can tell us quite a lot about what's going on. So you can see that we've got quite a range in here for, for some different diseases, um, and the ones that I've highlighted show you that some of the more recent studies have, are able to show that there are some very big ranges. So the difference between a, a, a low level infector and a, a super spreader can be really quite significant. And particularly if you look at the data for influenza, um, which is, is highlighted, you can see there's a vast range in here um, where by the, the lower end are probably unlikely to result in transmission. The top end are probably the super spreaders. So for SARS-CoV-2, we don't have this um, data. There is some estimates. Um, so a paper from Buonanno estimated um, the, the, this data based on um, measured viral loads from swabs um, for different vocalization type activities. Um, and there's an estimate from a, a study we did on the Skagit choir outbreak, which we got a very high value for quanta which you would expect to get. But what you can see is, you know, there's, there's some quite big ranges in here. Um, and if you start to put these into a, um, a, a transmission model, this is a, 
a, a, a Monte Carlo transmission model um, just to do a simple scenario. What you can see is particularly if the ventilation rate is low, that if you increase the quanta generation rate, um, you can have something that ranges from almost no transmission at all uh, when you've got a low quantum generation rate and, and somebody's it's a, it's a transient environment where it's not had a chance to build up yet, through to very high transmission rates when you've got longer periods of time in the room and higher quantum generation rates. Um, in some sense, this is perhaps not very helpful, um, but the reason I'm showing it is that actually we have these very, very big ranges in here. Um, so these are all involving studies which are, were assumed, uh, made some very big assumptions, assumed fully mixed flow. The real world complexity of this is, is actually quite different, and many of you will be fully aware of this already. Um, we know that we've got air distribution within and between zones, they're not fully mixed at all. We've got some incredibly variable ventilation rates, particularly when it's naturally ventilated. Um, and we've got influence from people and heat sources. We know too that movement, uh, measurement of this is all very challenging. So we often, CO2 is used as a proxy, but even that is quite difficult because it depends on a very big number of parameters um, and doesn't, you know, there's not a single easy number for this. But just to give you some illustrations of some of this complexity, um, this is a study that we carried out uh, uh, a few years ago now where we were looking to measure uh, natural ventilation flow rates. Um, the study is, is carried out in full scale, ex full scale experimental. So we've got a six by six by six meter cube and it's got openings in either side of it. Um, you can see the car for scale. Um, and then we, we looked at this cube on its own. And then we looked at what happens if we put an array of buildings around it, which were created out of hay bales. And measured over over several months, um, multiple parameters um, to to characterise the flow within and inside this cube, and then we actually carried out a CFD modelling study as well, using both fluent and opening foam um, transient flow models, again for the same set of scenarios. Um, and just to show you some of the some of the results from this is some of the CFD results where we've got cases where the, um, the, the flow for the isolated cube is parallel. We've got two openings on the sides and the, the flow is parallel to those openings. And we looked at changing the angle of that cube to look at what would happen to the flow. And as you might expect, when you've got your flow perpendicular, you get this, uh, this very clear jet that goes straight through the, through the cube. Um, and you've got a, the highest ventilation rate happens in there. As you rotate the, the uh, cube, you get a different flow features in there. And at 165 degrees, you see that the jet disappears. We've now just got these, the, uh, these sort of tiny jets on both sides. And then when we get to 150, we get a little bit from both sides. So you get a shift in the behavior of the ventilation in that cube. When we put that cube into an array of other buildings, uh, the blue cube is a little hard to see now, but I think the thing to point out is that it doesn't really matter on your wind angle now. Um, the blue cube, we never see that jet straight through anymore because of the way that the, the turbulent mixing in the, um, within the array disrupts that flow and doesn't allow the, um, the jet to form in the same way. And if we look at the data over all of these studies on ventilation rate, so this is the, 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 the normalised ventilation rate, the, the grey or red dots are the experimental measurements and then the, the solid blue and red triangles are the, the, the CFD data. Um, you can see that when you've got the cube on its own with cross ventilation flow, both sides open, you get a peak in the ventilation rate uh, at, at 250, about 240 degrees, and then uh, the, the minimum ventilation rate is around about 150. Once we put it into an array, we see that it's, it's a lot messier, but we see that it smooths out and the overall ventilation rate is a bit lower. When we have this as a single-sided ventilation, so we've only got only one opening open, um, you can see that, um, again, that the, the most even is in the array, but it is the lowest ventilation rate of all of them. Um, so you can sort of see that that 
simply open a window <laughs> it's quite complex because it really depends on your building and what's surrounding it and the wind angle um, we have done quite a bit of work indoors in buildings so uh, we were lucky a few years ago to get access into a a, a disused hospital ward and using co2s as, as a tracer within that ward to measure uh, look at the the ex potential exposure of um, people within um, that's that that environment um, and just to show you a couple of the results um, we've got a scenario here where the source the um, co2 is released at a particular source and we look at the exposure for healthcare workers and other patients p1 p2 and p3 um, and we've got the scenario here where it's it's where it's cross ventilation so windows on both sides are open um, and we can see that uh, the, the dark blue bars show us that the this room is fairly well mixed. We shut the windows, it remains fairly well mixed and the red bars, um, but the risk goes up about fourfold. Um, and it, you know, it's not that surprising, we shut the windows, the ventilation drops, um, but it's, it's a, it allows us to, to put some quantification in there. We also realised that when the wind was below a particular velocity, and I can't off the top of my head remember what it was, um, that we, we saw some slightly different behaviour go on um, and it's no longer just wind driven, there's a thermal drive in there too. Um, more complex set of data for when we put partitions between the beds. What we then saw was that um, you still get reasonable, um, some mixing in there, but you do find that you increase the exposure close to the source and for the um, patient who's opposite, but you decrease the exposure to those who are um, to the to the sides of the partitions. Um, and we also found again we had a small data set which was on on days where the low the, the wind velocity was very low, and we got some. Um, you can see for P one you got a really high um, exposure there because it, it was stagnating in that that's that uh, location. Um, and to whistle through some of these because I'm conscious of time. Um, something quite recent that we've we've been looking at is uh, what happens with with mixing. And this is a, a, a simple scenario using the water tank model to look at how, what happens if somebody walks in a corridor. Imagine they cough in that corridor and then they walk. How does that cough get dispersed in that corridor? So quite a nice experimental study, which shows that you get this Gaussian mixing that happens and it allows you to then put together a, a relationship between the, the walking speed, the corridor width, the person and time and it predicts uh, concentrations that you might see uh, spatially with time. Um, and we use this to do a, a very simple exposure risk model and said, okay, we've, we've released our quantum of infection in here. Um, can we look at the, the dose received as somebody walks down this corridor breathing in a particular way um, and what you see is that the transient model gives you um, a much higher um, higher peak than if we assumed it was a fully mixed but the actual overall dose is slightly lower so it's a bit it, you know it, it's a I think, I think the take-home message was this was hold your breath and run down the corridor but that's not really very practical most of the time. Um, just to, I, just to very briefly, in fact, actually, I'm going to skip over these because I'm really conscious of time. Um, and I'm going to talk last of all about upper room um, germicidal uh, ultraviolet irradiation, which um, is one strategy for uh, controlling transmission. Um, it's a, a mechanism where we use the UVC irradiation and um, <coughs> The, um, the inactivation of pathogens depends on the particular susceptibility of a pathogen to the uh, UV light and the um, amount of irradiation received. So it is, a, a, again, a complex interaction. It's the interaction between the airflow and the UV field and depends on the, 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 the microorganism too. Um, just to show you what one of these looks like, this is one of the uh, uh, an upper room UV units where you can see, um, although the blue is not the ultraviolet, it's just got blue light in there too, 
um, but you can see it, it's set up in such a way to generate a field of light above the heads of the occupants. So the idea is that the any microorganisms in the air will pass up, um, pass uh, with the, the natural air flows in the room, will pass up through that UV field and be inactivated as they pass through it. Um, and you can see we've, we've, we've measured and modelled the, the UV field, and then we can implement that into some um, airflow models. So this is actually the same ward model that we showed before, um, although uh, this is with open rather than with the partitions, but we can model this as a, a cross ventilation flow. Uh, um, it's actually a steady state model um, rather than a, a transient model here. Um, with the, um, the, the wind entering at uh, the left side, um, following the wind angle, and you can see it um, the cross flow through that uh, room. We've then got a, a scenario where we um, put the, uh, assumed that we'd have UV devices on a wall and considered whether they were on the windward or leeward side of that building, um, and whether they were particular heights um, in that in the space um, and just to show you how we can what this looks like if you've got a, a, your particular fixtures on the walls what you then end up with is a uh, the, the the interaction between the the flow and the UV light is modeled through uh, a, 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 a passive scalar to model the, the dose um, and you can see how the dose received is transported through the room um, in, in different ways in different places in the room. And what we looked at then was to say, well, actually, depending on the ventilation rate, depending on the positioning, what would we like to see in here? Um, and essentially showed that slightly you get a... Uh, slightly better effect with its leeward than windward but it's really hard to say there's any difference in there to be quite honest um, but there's a very big spread and particularly at low ventilation rates you've got a very big spread in the the dose uv dose received so actually you could get some quite significant variation in performance um, depending on the location of these devices with respect to the ventilation I'm sorry, that was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I wanted to just then finish up by um, drawing some conclusions. So um, for, for SARS-CoV-2 and for respiratory diseases, we really struggle to understand the roots of transmission, the relative importance, they're very difficult to determine. Um, we do know already that the virus, the, the viral exposure will be highest at close range. And that may be the most difficult one to mitigate. And we know that ventilation really matters. But we still need quite a lot of extra understanding in here about how we characterise and measure ventilation in buildings, how we understand air mixing and distribution, and how we actually understand how best to deploy some of these technology solutions to correctly design and deploy them. And I just wanted to leave with a few thoughts from a fluid dynamics perspective. So the whole process here is a fluid dynamics process, but it's not fluid dynamics on its own. And the, there are a lot of unknowns, both the physics, but then the biological, and then how that relates to human behavior too. Um, and when we take from an idealized scenario into uh, a, a, a very, um, complex real world scenario, what matters and when. And I think one example I would give here is, you know, relating exposure to risks. So we, there's a lot of models which can show where droplets can go, where people, you know, how they could be carried further by the wind, for example, under certain scenarios. But then what's the actual risk of that happening? And it, you know, what's the risk that that of infection associated with that? And what's the probability that it actually happens? And therefore, to, in order to answer these, we need some interdisciplinary collaboration. So we need to make sure that we interface the fluid dynamics of this with the understanding of the microbiology and with clinicians so we can take that knowledge into um, changes in um, systems and design. And last thing I would say is the future of ventilation. We know that it matters far more than just for COVID. It matters for many other things too. Um, we have a new network on this. So if people have got a ventilation interest, please get in touch with us. And this is thinking 
about how we can take some of what we know from the fluid dynamics perspective, from a ventilation design perspective, right through to health and the future of building design. And with that, um, a lot of people to say thank you to whose work appeared in this talk today and a lot of collaborators on here who have, I've worked with over several years um, and including those very recently who've uh, been involved with some of the SAGE um, environmental modelling group work. And with that, I'm going to stop. Um, I knew I'd written too many slides. Um, so you didn't talk much about mixing. I would have thought mixing was uh, was kind of interesting. You, you talked about things not being fully mixed. But then yes. do you get things like barriers to mixing? Is that important for you? Yeah, so I didn't. And, and I think one of the reasons I didn't do that was I realised that I didn't have very much very much evidence of how important that is um, and actually not very many good sides on that but right. it, it, it's, it, it, it is a really interesting question in that we can show that many spaces are not fully mixed um, but what is the significance of that how does that actually affect impact on your actual exposure risk um, and that that I think is a, a uh, still a, an open question there is data on it out there and you can certainly show that if you assume a steady state scenario in a particular space um you can very easily show that well yes if the you know the, the mixing is incomplete you could you could be you could have twice the exposure in one location to another yeah. um my concern is that actually spaces are not steady state so what does it look like under real transient conditions mm. and that's a lot harder to put together and what you do see i think is that when you you take some of these variabilities into account you see that they actually start to get smoothed out when you start to then go into risk with it yeah thanks Thanks, and if I can sort of follow up slightly on that I mean that one of the assumptions here is somehow that it's only the cumulative dose that matters yeah. and that's probably not true and so it's it, I mean there's a whole question about higher order statistics of the of the inhalation and and so on as well as so as well as spatial and temporal variation in the in the fluid mechanics sense there's also the response yeah variation. yeah uh, and that's why, I mean, we, you can take the outputs of these, you can connect them up with a dose response model. Um, that would certainly uh, tell you, or at least give you some clues as to whether you could achieve, what you could achieve as a short duration peak dose versus a longer duration cumulative dose. But what we don't know is biologically, at what point do those things matter or not matter? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the importance of ventilation is becoming clearer. Is there an effort to combine ventilation in building design with thermal insulation, a big climate change issue? Uh, yeah, yes, this, this has to be uh, going forward what we do. We need, we need to figure out ways in which we can provide high levels of ventilation with good thermal performance, with low carbon heating. Um, I think if, if this pandemic has taught us nothing, it, it's taught us that we our ventilation rates in most buildings are inadequate and we can't simply just reduce the ventilation rate to improve energy performance because that won't give us the answer so we now need those solutions that connect it all together and i mean there is a clear trade-off isn't there between high levels of ventilation and thermal comfort yeah. in winter which is of course one of the reasons that we we get much bigger problems in the winter i think um, well. Yes, it is quite likely that it is. It's certainly a contributor to the bigger problems in winter. How much it is, is very difficult to say. Um, I, I, I think there may be other drivers that, that make that important too um, in, in different seasons. But yes, it's, it's a big point. Uh, hello. Uh, Bruno, yes. You have a, may I yeah. ask a question? Yes, yes please go ahead. Hi, uh, it's Chen Feng. I'm an academic from Suwangsu University. Uh, thanks, Kaz, for the very nice presentation. I did learn a lot. Uh, a, a quick question here. Of course, we do not know much about COVID, partially because it's new and it's uh, so, uh, uh, well, I guess it's uh, ri very risky to carry out any quantified measurement. But what about uh, uh, other diseases, let's say influenza or the, 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 the previous ones? which, uh, is there any uh, consensus there? Uh, 
in a sense that, for example, whether mixing uh, 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 had an effect and whether or not uh, the, for example, the infection is uh, uh, strongly correlated to the accumulation or, or the peak. So, so about the other diseases, uh, respiratory diseases, is there any consensus? Yeah, there? you're right. And, and actually what this is also highlighted, I think is the lack of information for other diseases too. It, um, conventionally this has been a very very small research field it's a very niche research field um it's uh, whether it's amongst the fluid dynamics community or whether it's amongst the um the medical community there's there's tiny numbers of people who who worked on this and it's been quite hard to get funding because it, it's not seen as important and yet you realize suddenly how important it actually is it is also incredibly hard to unpick the transmission routes. So I was involved in a, a study a few years ago um, on flu transmission, where again, it was driven by the 2009 flu pandemic. There was questions about, is it airborne or is it droplet and what masks were needed by healthcare workers? And we conducted a human challenge study whereby we, um, infected, deliberately infected what we call donors and allowed them to interact in spaces with recipients. And some of those donors had interventions. So they wore face shields to prevent large droplets. They had very strict hand hygiene. So essentially we were trying to make sure that their only exposure was the airborne route. Mm -hmm. And that study, um, it, it was huge. I mean, to run a study like that required us to have a whole building, which was the quarantine unit. You had to have a whole whole healthcare team. You had to have the local hospital on standby in case something went wrong. Um, and we barely got any transmission, so we couldn't prove anything. We got one case and we think it was airborne, but we couldn't say. So we, you know, and, and actually to, to even to carry out those studies is very hard because yeah. people, it's very hard to actually infect people deliberately um but yeah. when you're trying to do it in the in with with what you call wild cases again it's very hard because you know what we really want is the data on what they're exhaling um but you've got to find them and get them <laughs> measure them <laughs> very quickly very very difficult to do so so, so even uh, for the previous the safer disease it's, it's still very much like very difficult to do yeah so i mean the disease probably with most evidence is tuberculosis um but mm -hmm. And that's because that has been one of the ones where environmental, uh, we know it's airborne and therefore environmental control, um, ventilation control. Um, a lot of the work around UV disinfection came about because of TB. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we move on to Bruno Fraga. You have a question, you have a hand raised. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the, for the talk, Kath. It's very interesting. And I wanted to ask you about um, certification in particular, the role of a certification in, in this. Um, I was wondering if a certific certification, thermal certification indoors could be actually something that could help us to um, conduct uh, the, the aerosols to some specific places could be actually something we could use and how, uh, how uh, the mixing, uh, the ventilation and, and the mixing of, of the different layers of air maybe sometimes have a contradictory effect of a contracting effect of the one of the stratification, if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think it, I think it could be quite important. I know Paul's done a lot of work on this and I, I think there are times it could help. I think there are times it could possibly hinder too. So I think you have to be a little bit careful with it, but I think absolutely, I think, I, I think if it's a well-designed system, for example, a, a displacement ventilation system where you bring the air low and you, you're extracting high, it has a really good potential. Challenge you've got is what you do for all the buildings that exist already because changing ventilation flows. Um, and in my, to, my, to me, the, the biggest priority is that we have to deal with the spaces that don't have any ventilation before we worry about changing air distribution patterns. Um, in most spaces, but we should be certainly thinking about that more carefully for, for design going forward in the future and how we can build in um, barriers via ventilation um, and build in the capacity to, to create higher ventilation flows when we need them. 
from the chat. Is it known what the main drivers of transmission were in the first UK lockdown? He was surprised how small in effect supermarkets were. Yeah, so the, the model that I showed you there was, it was only for the looking at the airborne components. So it wasn't looking at what would happen when somebody's close together um, or anything off surfaces. Uh, drivers of transmission are really hard to understand. Um, a lot of transmission is associated with workplaces, but it's not necessarily within a workplace. And for example, even things like food processing plants, which have seen high outbreaks, um, quite often that is to do with um, accommodation travel for migrant workers rather than the actual place itself. The reason the supermarket looks small from a risk modelling perspective is there's a number of reasons. One is the fact that it's actually a, on the whole a big volume space and so any of the any virus that is in the air is going to be pretty dilute. Um, the other thing is that people actually spend pretty short amount of time in there so compared to your exposure that you might get over a, a whole day in an office, the exposure that you will get over, over a, a half an hour in a, in a supermarket is considerably lower. So it's, it's about adding different risk factors together. 